forward. Okay, we're now recording. So I'm going over the chapter three practice test uh, from our map that we covered on Tuesday, August 11th. Uh, we didn't get to these problems at the end. This is on linear functions. Um, so if I look at the first, or one, two, four, five, I suppose, those are four problems I see right now. For number one, you're told you have a linear function. So you wanna make sure things are increasing in a constant fashion. So, or you can look at slope if you wanna think of that way too. So notice that x goes up by four, right? If x goes up by four, y is going up by three. So it's a four to three ratio. So my slope is four thirds. Remember, so slope is a ratio. Okay, that was horribly written, but yeah, it's four thirds. So in this case, x is going up by, uh, I'm sorry, three fourths. Wow, I can't believe I did that. It's a three fourths ratio because you change y over change y, not change of x over y. My bad. So it'll be fine if I follow the same, you know, type of ratio for the next pair, but it's okay. Let's be, let's do it right. Change y over change in x. So y went up by three, x went up by four. So now, if x is going up by six, and I'll call this a, um, I'll just choose a letter like A. If I solve for A, 4A equals 18, A is gonna equal 4.5. So apparently, we're supposed to go up by 4.5. So this is gonna be 3.5. So you want the difference of y to be 4.5 and the difference of x to be six, so you get a three to four ratio. And that's what the answer C for that one. So you have to think of a uh, slope and ratios. And so we look at how the x, y change for the first two pairs of points. And we saw that it was a three to four ratio for the change y or change in x or the slope is three fourths. So you follow the same thing. Or you could have done k minus negative one or six minus zero equals three fourths, ah, jeez, okay. <laughs> and if you work it out, four times k plus one, four k plus four equals 18, you still get the same thing. You still have 3.5, so. Uh, for two, uh, again, uh, it's doing a slope. You have a slope of one third, it looks like, and passes to 0.91. Second line has that, they intersect. So you gotta find where they intersect, so you gotta find the equation of each of those lines. And so if you look at the solution key, that could help sometimes. Um, see, I found the equation of the first line, slope of one third, pass through the point nine one. Second line um, has those two points, so you find the slope, you can do point slope form, get that equation outlined. Then you have to solve for the point of intersection. You can do substitution if you like, uh, and solve for x. And you get x equals three. And then y gets is negative one, and they want, I guess, you to add those two values. Is that correct? There we go, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for four, if a line um, has points in those three quadrants, but not quadrant two, so remember, uh, the quadrants look like this, quadrant one, two is always upper left, three is lower left, and four is lower right. And again, one is upper right. So uh, quadrant two is totally bypassed. So clearly the slope is positive. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> With a negative y intercept. Uh, for five, you just have to, you could like plug in points, like you plug in one, one, it should work itself out nicely. It does for B and C, not A and D. If I play negative one, uh, you wanna get five coming out, I don't. For C as I do for B. So process elimination, which of the following? I read as POE, process of elimination. Um, that's kind of the best approach there. So it kind of gives you a general idea of what's happening. Um, some of the funky problems, um, I don't see some of the funky ones. Like what I'm talking about is like the ones where you have no solution, infinitely many solutions. Like um, uh, 
yeah, like for number five and number six, you want that as, as the end result or for number three. What you need to do is uh, isolate Y and think about these graphically. If you think about these graphically, you're gonna be okay. Because um, then if there's no solution, you have two lines, you don't want the lines to touch if it's no solution. Uh, if it's infinitely many solutions, then you want the two lines to be identical. When two lines don't touch, like in the first case here, you have the same slope. That's why it helps to isolate Y. Because we have Y isolated, the coefficient of X is gonna be your slope, you want those to be identical. Here, you're gonna have the same slope, and um, same y-intercept. So that's what you want there for that one. Um, so I just wanna make sure I recap that. Um, now, rest of us all kind of dealing with slope and stuff, I mean, here for uh, number three, which of following is equal to zero? So you process elimination. So basically asking which of following could equal uh, zero. It's gonna be C because if you were to isolate the absolute value, move the five from left to right, you get some of that could work. Um, but for A, for example, A would be a problem if you isolate the absolute value, then all of a sudden we move the positive five from left to right, becomes negative five on the right side. An absolute value of an expression can never equal negative number, right? Absolute values never equal negatives. And you can run into the same scenario with B and D as well. So that's not good. You don't want that. <clears throat> um, so that's C and then for six, if you plug this in for X over here, <clears throat> then it's negative six times half X minus one, Distribute and clean it up. And that's what we get A's and Apple. So that's just kind of recapping some stuff we did um, on Tuesday. Um, I can go over 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 if there are any questions about them. Are there any? Are there any that you'd like me to do? Or we can move on to reading. Okay, we'll move on to reading. Um, okay. Let me share my screen again. And also let people contribute if we want them to. Okay, so we're gonna open up this packet. Um, oh, did I close it? That was, that was smart. Um, here we go. So there's a lot of reading. Uh, we just tr try to get to all of it today. I don't know if we can, but um, at least let's try to do three passages today. I think that'd be good. I'm gonna do one with you guys. And then uh, I'll have you guys go in breakout rooms and do one in that and we'll, then we'll talk about it. And then we'll, we'll do another one together. Then maybe do another one in breakout rooms and then see where we are. By the time people will be done. So, but we are gonna get through most of the screen packet. Um, so you have six, five minutes, for two questions. That's for, um, Recommended time. Of course, if you have extended time, you will get more time based upon your accommodations. Uh, it's five passages, uh, usually 10 or 11 questions each. Uh, I don't think you'll ever see anything with 12 questions or nine, nine questions, usually 10 or 11 questions each. Um, the topics could vary. Uh, sometimes it could be literature based or an adaptation from a novel. You can see here this is from a very famous novel on Don Quixote by uh, Miguel de Cervantes. Um, so um, yeah, that. The second passage looks like that's um, something that's more social science or historical. This is about um, women's suffrage. So uh, it's a US history type of passage. And it's written a long time ago. And you do wanna be mindful of uh, anything that's written over a hundred years ago. It can be a little bit dense with the uh, English. Um, so it can be really tough to sometimes follow what they want. Sometimes I try to skip those initially and come back to them later. You do have to kind of take that pause and really reflect on what you've read to make sure you understood what they said. Because the way people spoke English 100 years ago is way different than the way we speak now, right? So um, just be a little mindful about that. This is a little more modern. That's good. 
This is um, kind of more science-like. It's about something about the geological survey and groundwork. So they have something about natural science sometimes. Um, this one here is about bananas and diplomacy. So something you might see perhaps in a journal, as you see, but it's a really long time ago. Um, geez, they really are in some old stuff here. And then um, this one here is about um, neuroscience and music. So a mixture of some science and history and some literature, right? Kind of like the stuff you do in school. Um, occasionally, well, not occasionally, they'll definitely have one passage There's a dual passage, like two passages side by side. I mean, there will be some compare and contrast questions you be, need to be mindful about. Um, occasionally, they'll put some tables or graphics like you have here. So, you know, you have to make sure we approach those questions correctly. They love these paired questions. Like you look at 21 and 22 are paired up, 26, 27 are paired up. Where the second question in the pair is referring to the evidence used to back up the previous question. So we'll talk about how to approach those questions as well. And see, there's another graphic there. So, you know, it's, that's kind of what we expect. Uh, we do expect some line reference questions of vocab and context, like 15 and 17. Or asking how those words um, are being used in the past, what they most nearly mean in the passage. Um, sometimes they might have some general questions like the central problem, uh, something like that, um, or something very um, specific, like number 12, sometimes referring to something very specific. So those are all things that we have to be mindful about that we, we could be asked. So let's look at passage one, the one on uh, Don Quixote. And what I'll do before I get too carried away is kind of to get a lay of the land. Like how many lines am I dealing with and what questions do I have? Obviously I have 64 lines here. And some of the questions I have, I, well, the first couple look like the pretty general questions. I might want to save those for the end. Uh, number three, I know what to look at, lines one to 24. So the evidence is going to be in those lines. Um, here, they're referring to a particular phrase in the passage, which my guess is probably after line 24. So when we hit that phrase, we should, we should be able to answer that one. Uh, five is kind of a standalone question. Um, and it's referring to probably something very specific in the passage there. Um, six is a little more general, but six and seven are actually paired up. Uh, eight and nine are paired up. And then 10 refers to something at the end of the passage. So by doing this, I kind of see there's a bit of a chronological order to these questions, right? Um, so I'll, I'll want to um, respect that. And it's actually referring to line 17. Uh, I think that chronological order actually manifests itself a bit more clearly in passages two. You see how it says lines 27 to 28, line 33, line 47, line 59, um, line 6 to 75. So the reason why I'm pointing that out is that that's going to help us in the way we approach the reading. So we're going to read this in a linear fashion. We're not going to like jump around like they jump from the beginning to end to the middle. But we will do is we will actually take a break from reading and answer some questions while we take a break. I don't want you reading this all in one shot. Some people can do it, uh, but that's very hard to do, especially when, you, um, when you're taking a long test and you might encounter some passages that are not terribly interesting. So I don't want you to lose focus and I want you to keep your level of engagement high. So what we do is we break the passages up into thirds. So there's six, four lines. So that does not be perfect. Like, Maybe line up to line 24 might be a good place to take a break. So I'll read lines 1 through 24, answer any questions that um, are covered, which number 3 will be co covering those lines, and see if maybe, maybe number 4 is covered, number 5 is covered. Then I go back and then I read some more. I'll probably take another break around line 38, perhaps, and maybe I can answer some questions along the way there. And then I'll, um, it looks like maybe 8 and 9 I could probably do, because the evidence for 9 is contained in those lines and the raise from line 17. Um, then I'll um, finish off reading it and then do the remainder of the questions. Um, so we take, so we basically read a little bit, answer some questions. You read a little bit, answer some questions. Uh, so it's kind of this back and forth strategy. Um, so that's what we'll do. And you are gonna read everything. You're not gonna skim. So we do wanna make sure we read every word because we really wanna get a good feel for the context. So I'll kind of get us kickstart. I'm gonna read the first 24 lines. I'm going to answer number three for you guys. And then we'll kind of take turns. Um, so we'll kind of do this together. And then I'll let you guys go in breakout rooms. Maybe we'll do um, groups of two or three. 
and then you guys will, you know, kind of read to your own, but then maybe compare your answers afterwards, and then we'll come back and talk about it. We'll do the, um, we'll probably do past two for the breakout rooms in about 15 minutes from now. Um, and that's the, t the pacing. You want to do these in about 12 or 13 minutes each. Um, so, because again, you have five passes, do the math, six, five divided by five is 13. So I'll get started. Uh, at this point, they came in sight of 30 or 40 windmills that are on that plane. Fortune, said Don Quixote to the squire, as soon as he had seen them, is arranging matters for us better than we could hope. Look there, friend Sancho Panza, where 30 or more monstrous giants rise up all from my mean to engage in battle and slay, and with whose spoils we shall begin in battle and slay. Um, sorry, I read that over. <laughs> and with whose spoils we shall begin to make our fortunes. For this is righteous warfare, and as God's good service to sweep so evil and breathe from off the face of the earth. And Sancho Panza says, what giants? Said Sancho Panza. Those you see there, answered his master, with the long arms that some have nearly two leagues long. And so the footnote is saying that's just seven miles. Okay, so he's clearly, Don Quixote is exaggerating. He's thinking these windmills are monsters, right? Um, and he's really kind of making their... Um, using a lot of hyperbole and exaggeration. Sancho's kind of the voice of reason here, right? Look, your worship, what we see there are not giants, but windmills. And what seem to be their arms and veins that turned by the wind make the mills stone go. So obviously, Sancho Ponce is a realist, right? The Don Quixote says, it is easy to see that you are not used to this business of adventures. Those are giants. And if you're afraid, away with you out of here and betake yourself to prayer while engaged in and fierce and unequal combat. So Don Quixote seems very convinced that they're monsters, right? <laughs> so you always take a little pause and annotate. I'm, I'm obviously talking to myself when I'm um, doing this. Uh, and the real thing, you probably don't really, can't really be talking to yourself. You could maybe murmur, but you kind of want to make a mental note of what you're reading. So now let's look at um, the question here, number three. Then in the course of the six paragraphs, lines 1 to 24, the main character focus shifts from what to what? So the main character is Don Quixote, and he basically shifts from like, um, you know, some sort of level of excitement that he sees these monsters and he's getting ready to fight them to a point where he's kind of um, arguing with his assistant, like saying, dude, you know, these are monsters, man. Like, you're, you're crazy that you think these windmills. Um, that's Don Quixote's perspective, right? Whereas Sancho Panza's thinking the other way around. Um, I wouldn't say a recollection of past victories. That doesn't make any sense. Um, not money. I wouldn't say B either. Money kind of kills. So you have to be very critical here, right? Um, some words will kill the choice. That kills it. That kills it. So A and B are out. Um, specific rules of combat? I don't. I think that's out too. And how to wage a successful battle? I think that's out. A battle should end before him to an argument. He's arguing with his faithful companion, and he's evaluating the enemy. Totally, that's what's happening. It's going to be D. So it helped that I answered right after I finished those lines because it's fresh in my head, right? Um, I don't think we can answer four yet because uh, I don't think we've sweep so evil a breed. No, we have actually. I lied. We can't. That's in line 10. So for this is right warfare and it's God's good service to sweep so evil a breed from off the face of the earth, okay? So at the end of the second paragraph, duh, we could do that because we, we read past the second paragraph. Uh, mainly has which of the following effects. Um, well, again, it kind of just shows the um, exaggerated language that Don Quixote is using. So let's just take a look, see what choices would make sense for us. As a horror story, that will probably, uh, I don't think horror story is really a good choice there. A prophet, like a messenger for God, I don't think so either. It is exaggerated language he's using, um, and it's his view and the battle he's about to undertake. I like to see a lot. Uh, I don't think that's really what's happening there. I mean, religious fanaticism. I mean, it is talking about religion um, a little bit, but the point of my, yeah, I think that's just taking a little too literal. So I'd probably go see. You really want to be neutral, you know, <clears throat> kind of moderate through choices. So definitely that one I could answer, just again, fresh in my head. Um, now, we've got to be careful of five. Um, the passage in the case of Don Quixote would characterize the trust. It's not what we think. 
It's not what his assistant thinks. It's what Don Quixote himself thinks. And Don Quixote thinks he's doing something that's very um, brave, right? Um, he says, you know, he tells us, this is, if, you're, if you're worried, um, then away with you. Um, and how he just seems to be very um, convinced that he's fighting his monsters. So I'd probably say brave for D or D for five. Um, so again, that's what I'm doing. So now um, I'll just kind of take a look at the screen and see who I see. So the first time I see my screen is uh, Taylor. So Taylor, um, if you don't mind, uh, would you read lines um, 25 to 38 out loud for us, please? Yeah. Thank you. So saying he gave the spur to his steed, Rosinante, he lists of the circles the squire Sancho sent after him, warning him that most certainly they were windmills and not giants he was going to attack. He, however, was so positive they were giants that he neither heard the cries of Sancho nor perceived, near as near as he was, what they were. Fly not, cowards and vile, and vile beings, he shouted, for a single night attacks you. A slight breeze at this moment sprang up, and the great veins began to move. Through ye flourish more arms than the giant Briaris. Ye have to reckon with me, exclaimed Don Quixote when he saw this. Thank you. So yeah, so we're getting more just evidence that Don Quixote is just very convinced. He's fighting monsters. You know, he's kind of like talking to them. <clears throat> Whereas uh, Sancho Panza um, was doing his best to kind of um, warn his master. And um, and so he lists of the cry. So basically, um, Banco is not heeding the advice from his squire. Um, so now let's see if there's any other question we could maybe answer. I mean, it does help to confirm three, four, five. We took care of those. Wanted to probably actually I could probably do one. The main person the opening sentence. I probably should have done that initially. So the opening sentence is um at this point they came inside of 30 or 40 windmills that are on that plane. Um so uh Brandon, I see you um next to my screen. If you look at the choices for number two, which one do you think we could probably eliminate? Because again, if you look at the opening sentence, the opening sentence is that, um, the opening sentence of the whole passage, right? Yeah. Um, at this point, they came inside of 30, 40 windmills that are on that point. So it's kind of a st uh, established, it's like visual imagery, right? Um, so what choices, Brandon, do you think we could probably eliminate? Uh, probably B or C. I'd agree. Um, not <laughs> technology advances. Um, describe the film which a great battle is about to take place. Um, yeah, I might let me look at the choices. Let me look at the answer queue uh, just to be 100% sure. That one seems a little bit weird to me. Um, so they have, so it's good. You definitely got rid of the right choices. Um, <clears throat> whoop. Um, yeah, B and C wouldn't work. Um, yeah, it does for later plot purposes and inform the reader. So A, I think would make sense. I mean, detail imagery I liked, but to enhance the mood, I'm not sure if it's enhancing anything, um, but it is informing us what we're seeing in the setting. So yeah, so I think A would make sense. But good job on getting rid of B and C. Um, I could probably answer eight and nine as well. So these are a little tricky. Um, <clears throat> So the passing case of Don Quixote does not believe Sancho's description of the giants because, well, why does he not believe him? Um, and that's because Don Quixote thinks that his squire is scared. Um, and, you know, it doesn't really have faith, I guess. Um, and we're looking for the right evidence. So, um, so Jonathan, I see you next to my screen. So, um, what choices do you think we can eliminate right away? Like that for sure would not work. Um, so again, for number eight, Don Quixote does not believe Sancho's description of the giants. So Sancho is saying that, you know, he's trying to tell them what they are literally, they are windmills. But Don Quixote does not believe that because he thinks that Sancho's scared, I guess. 
But which ones, which choice do you think we can get rid of, Jonathan, that you know for sure wouldn't work for AIDS? If you're there, Jonathan, if you're not, um, maybe you're away from your computer. Okay, so Sophie, I see you next. Um, so what choice do you think we can get rid of for eight? Um, well, I said A and C, or like okay. across the Yeah, A's, A's makes no sense. I said it's not as good, it makes no sense. Um, yeah, what, what, what's going on C, it makes no sense either. Um, C, like, who's for instance? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, I'm liking B a lot. Um, he claims that Sam's not as brave as he is because the kind of, they do say that. Uh, D uh, is, is too busy praying. No, that doesn't make sense. So I'll go B. Right? But notice that, like, initially, I want to eliminate, right? That's kind of my first instinct when I'm going through these. And then now that I kind of feel good about B for number eight, I'm looking for some evidence to back that up. So if I look at the evidence for nine, um, so Sophia, I'll have you help me out again. So what evidence do you think for nine would help us back up B? The answer we have for eight like you know which ones would show that down county feels that his squire is not as brave as he is well if you look at lines 20 to 24 they do say that those are, you know, where Don Quixote is saying, if you're afraid, away with you. The first two choices is just more their initial conversation, which is not really indicating that Don Quixote feels that Sancho is scared. But he does make an indication that he thinks Sancho is scared in lines 20 through 24, which backs up the answer for B for number eight, which is, you know, the answer we got for eight, which we feel good about. 32 to 33, just to be sure. Now, now he's talking to the windmills. So, um, so yeah, I would totally go C for nine. So that's kind of how I'd, I'd do that one. Then what we do is we um, finish reading. So we've tackled many questions. We've done two, three, four, five, and eight, nine. Um, so I don't really have that many left. Um, and it looks like, um, I was trying to look for something else here. Okay. Um, so let's go and finish and read the rest of this. So, um, so Grace, I see you next. Um, let's do line, why don't you read lines 39 to, um, well, just finish it off. So 39 to the end, because there's some more on the other page. All right. Um, so saying, he commended himself with all his heart to his lady, Dulcinea, imploring her to support him in such a peril. With lance braced and covered by his shield, he charged at Rocinante's fullest gallop and attacked the first mill that stood in front of him. But as he drove his lance point into the sail, the wind whirled it around with such force that it shivered the lance to pieces. It swept away with the horse and rider, and they were sent rolling over the plain, in sad condition indeed. Sancho hastened to his assistance as fast as his ass could go, and when he came up, found him unable to move. With such a shock, had Rocinante fallen with him. God bless me, said Sancho. Did I not tell your worship to mind what you were about, for they were only windmills? And no one could have made any mistake about it, but one who had mills of the same kind in his head. Hush, friend Sancho, replied Don. Quixote, the fortunes of war more than any other are liable to frequent fluctuations. And moreover, I think, and it is the, it is the truth, that the same sage Friston, who carried off my study and books, has turned these giants into mills in order to rob me of the glory of vanquishing them. Such is the enmity he bears me. But in the end, his wicked arts will avail, but little against my good sword. So thank you, Grace. Um, so we can see here that... Um... He tried to attack him, and um, obviously, um, it, you know, it caused him to fall to the ground. And then Sancho, uh, w you know, was trying to tell him, well, okay, you know, I told you, these are windmills. But Don Quixote is still kind of delusional. He, he feels that, well, all of a sudden, like, they turned into women. They were giants before. So he just still was convinced he was fighting giants. And the word Frist, or the person Friston, is now mentioned. 
So that's why it's good to kind of do these questions along the way because, um, you know, obviously when we answer number eight, we didn't know who person, what, 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 who's this person. So we wouldn't be fooled by it, I guess. Um, but now we can try some questions. So if we look at um, number one now, what choice best summarizes the passage? Um, so um, Alexa, I see you next. So what do you think about one? Um, which ones do you think are probably no good? Which one do you like? Alexa, if you're if you're by your computer, you could um, help us. If not, then maybe we'll go to another person. Uh, Liz, I see you next. Uh, so, what do you think about one? Uh, so, Liz says either A or C. Thank you for the chat. Um, I would agree with you. Um, one of those two is correct. I definitely don't like B. Uh, because only one guy is really fighting him. Um, yeah, I think C kind of makes the most um, sense. They, they, you know, they find themselves in an argument. Um, I wouldn't say A so much because, again, they're not both fighting him. Um, the windmills. Um, D could probably work for one as well. So the answer is actually going to be D instead. Um, I guess they that both two knights probably kills it for C because they said his squire, which is, you know, his assistant. So um, even though they are um, debating, maybe R might be a little bit strong also. So I think D was probably a bit safer for that one. Um, So, okay, um, let's take a look at, okay, thank you, Liz, for your friends, no problem. Um, then if we look at six and seven, um, essentially if you don't go to as a, no, I wouldn't say A, like endangers employees, or someone to fall in battle. Um, but someone like who is very faithful but requires help. So I'd probably say D for six. Um, but they also have B, which is also interesting too. So let's look at both, all, all the choice here. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? So lines 20 through 21. Uh, I wouldn't say that really backs up either B or D. 20 through 24. No, 25 to 28. Yeah, probably C will make sense. It'll probably back up B for number six, I'm guessing. Pious man means religious, and I don't think any of those pieces of evidence actually back that up. That uh, refers to Don Quixote being re religious. So even though I kind of like the, um, I'm probably going to have to go B. And I think C agrees with B. So sometimes if you're not really sure how to answer these questions, sometimes you want to maybe look at the evidence to see which of these evidence backs up one of these choices here. And I see how C could back up B. Because um, now you know that um, Sancho's the, you know, the assistant, because that's the squire, and how Sancho's trying to kind of look after him, trying to help him out. Um, yeah, so you have B and C for six, seven. Um, and then for 10, the reference to Friston. So Friston, they say, is some sort of uh, magician. Um, and it's the truth that the sa same sage Friston who carried off my studies and books has turned these giants. So someone who, um, again, is part of his imagination, it's kind of just more about his altered sense of reality. Um, Yeah, how he perceives reality probably would make sense there. Um, so I'd go A for that one. So that's kind of the whole point of the passage. So 
Uh, now what we'll do, we'll go in breakout rooms. Uh, I'll have you guys work on 11 to 20. Um, I'll give you guys till about 5.05 or so. Um, so about 12 to 13 minutes. We'll come back, we'll go through the answers. Um, then maybe we'll do uh, a dual passage, uh, the one at the end together. And by the time we get, it should be close to 5.30 at that point. Um, so. Uh, no worries, Jonathan, if you gotta go, no problem. So thank you for stopping by. Uh, so I'll stop the recording for now and put you guys in breakout rooms.